Um, all right, let's get started. Um, my name is Dorothy. I am. Uh, I work at Century as an events manager, um, and I'm really excited to kind of share our story today with Power HRG, um, how they streamline issue management and communication at scale. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we get started. Um, and just know that today it, the session will be recorded, so feel free to take notes if you'd like. But we will be able to get this video out to everyone. You know, either today or um, later today or tomorrow to everyone that came and to those that couldn't make it either. So don't worry, it will be recorded. Um, and then there is a survey at the end of this as well. It's just like two questions. It should only take you about a minute to fill out. If you are able to fill that out just with some feedback on how this went, we really take that um, into consideration in terms of how we structure and how we um, build these workshops to help you best. So just a couple housekeeping things. Um, and then in terms of what you guys will hear today, uh, obviously we'll go through some introductions and then Wade from Power Home Remodeling will kind of share his issue management workflow um, and how they use Sentry within their organization. Uh, and then Jasmine will be sharing what we've been working on in Dashboards and Discover and give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what's coming up next. And then um, Adam will kind of go through a, a live demo of our dashboard as well. And we will end with some Q&A. Um, feel free to use the chat in the Q&A as well throughout. Um, we will answer questions at the end. And then if possible, we will also try to chat and respond to questions as the call goes on. So just either way, uh, either way works. Um, and then in terms of your speakers, my name is Dorothy, as I just mentioned, um, I'll be kind of moderating this session. And then we've got Wade from Power HRG, Jasmine and Adam, both from our Century organization. So without further ado, um, Wade, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I will let you take it from here. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let me get my uh, screen shared over here. All right. I think that's the slide we should be seeing. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Wade Winningham. I'm a principal developer at Power Home Remodeling. And um, you may not have heard of us, but we sell windows, siding doors, and solar solutions to existing homeowners. Uh, we make about $700 billion a year in annual revenue, and we're growing. And um, most people who have visited our headquarters uh, say that they think we're a technology company who happens to sell windows. Um, a bit about our team. Um, Nitro is the name of our application. It runs on a 13-year-old monolith Ruby on Rails application. Um, we've got it organized as a component-based Rails application uh, that's over 100 components now. Um, so it's, it's basically, imagine like a, a Rails application that's made up of a lot of smaller Rails applications. Um, our BT department consists of 12 teams right now with five roles uh, that it consists of a handful of developers, UX, Quality Assurance, who we call our ninjas. Uh, we have Scrum Masters and Product Tiers. And uh, each one of those teams is responsible for a specific product area. Um, and those product areas are typically made up of one or more components within our application. So that's how it's kind of structured. Um, since our app is not a public facing app, I figured I would show a couple of screens. Uh, we have a, a few there. One is for you know just viewing a project. Uh, we've got a door builder application to help kind of uh, through a 3D model representation of a door and be able to apply its colors and, and uh, accessories and whatnot. And uh, we also have internal tools like an internal messaging tool and um, yeah, a tool that we use to track our agile process. So before Sentry, um, we used a competing product and um, it had no team support. So obviously it wasn't gonna work for us there, but it also had a lot of limited limitations as far as notifications and filtering and uh, it just generally was not scaling with us. And uh, luckily we did find Sentry uh, to switch to when we were looking for solutions. Um, our process before then is very manual, uh, a lot of back and forth uh, end users would contact our customer service desk. Um, and obviously they had a lot of roundabout and back and forth with them trying to figure out and reproduce issues. And then uh, our ninjas would chat with our developers and then there was probably a lot of uh, back and forth that goes on there as well um, between you know getting a support ticket entered and then getting that into you know development to be tested and then uh, eventually deployed out um, with Sentry, it's a bit more streamlined um, 
we obviously still have end users that call our customer service desk, but Sentry is, uh, you know, an ingestion point for getting issues uh, and through our system. Um, sometimes it tells us before users tell us. Um, so usually we'll get an alert or trigger or somebody will review it in Sentry, um, get a ticket assigned, and, and usually there's a lot of information there for a ninja to uh, be able to diagnose and, and get issues resolved a lot more quickly. Um, so it's really given us a lot of real-time visibility into our application. Um, it, it, being down just for an hour uh, during our busiest times of the day could mean up to a million dollars in lost revenue for our business. So it's really important for us to fix things fast and it would definitely you know, helps having Century uh, involved in that process. Um, one recent example is the integration of code owners uh, with uh, GitHub. Um, we use that for GitHub tracking and um, it, uh, it basically it, it just streamlines our own teams can can assign their components to themselves and update that list without having to get like an administrator involved on Sentry side to keep things in sync. So it's allowed us to kind of maintain our own uh, uh, you know workflow a lot easier. So that's helped a lot. So what I'm going to do is switch over to um, our Sentry account and kind of walk through a couple of things. One is a, a daily review that I do. Um, and, and most teams uh, do uh, walk through a couple of issues that are QA ninjas, uh, kind of how they use it. And then um, every couple of weeks, we do more of a departmental wide um, overview of how we're doing in Sentry uh, that kind of helps us keep our eye on the ball. So I was going to show us a couple of pages there. So let me switch over. So this is our account. This is what I usually see when I just log in first. Uh, First of all, uh, we've got a lot of unresolved issues in there, but usually I'm just concerned about what's happened maybe in the past 24 hours. Um, and we see here that uh, stuff that uh, is there, I've got about 21 items for review. So let's take a look at those. Um, I see that uh, Sentry is a hired, it's associated uh, a team with some of these already. Um, we've got an everyone team that's kind of like our, our uh, you know, catch all for, for certain things. and. Um, let's see, this one looks uh, pretty interesting. That's, uh, nobody's assigned to that. So I'll typically go in here, see that it's something with our marketing department. And um, I think we have a couple of teams here that are involved in marketing, Titans being one of them. So I think that looks like a, they should probably own this one. So I'm just gonna assign that to them and mark this as reviewed and then kind of go back. So I've kind of kind of walk through that. And on a typical day for our application, um, you know, I'm used to seeing maybe 20, 25 of these issues. So it really doesn't take very long to, uh, to go through them to kind of, uh, you know, uh, assign them to the right people. And hopefully other people are doing the same thing. So, you know, it just makes it that much quicker. Um, our ninjas, uh, when they go into the issues tracking, um, they, they'll typically get a call from an end user. So one of the things they might do is search for a particular user, let's say, uh, Brian Reed is calling into our uh, help desk. Um, they can quickly go in and see that, well, he hadn't had any issues today, but let's see, he had something recently. Um, they can look at the issues that he's run into so that uh, they can focus just on him. Uh, let's say he's calling about this one particular one where there's some kind of template missing. Uh, Sentry over here says that this might belong to the Heroes for Hire team, or there's this other guy over here, Garrett, who might uh, be involved. So it gives them uh, uh, people that they can reach out to to kind of get more information. Uh, another thing that they do that uh, is useful is go into tags. We see that there's two users affected here, and under tags, we've got a lot of useful information here. Uh, one thing is under devices. I only see a couple of older iPhones here, so maybe that is um, uh, something that's of interest. Uh, but down here under users, we can get more details on these and actually get a list of the username involved. Uh, so if there are some specific ones involved that, that are also having this issue, uh, we can reach out to them if they haven't reached out to us already and um, uh, get more information from them. Um, another thing is if our ninjas have some downtime, let's say they're not on the phone and have uh, you know a little bit of time before another call comes in, they like to do something called digging for treasure. Uh, so uh, if one of our ninjas happens to be working on a team responsible for uh, product configurations, um, they might search on the URL for product configs and find a list of stuff that maybe the team is ignoring, or maybe there's some stuff hidden down, maybe at the bottom of the list that might be important that, that, that they may not want to uh, raise awareness of on that team. Um, so they can dig in, get more information, check that tags, and, um, and 
you know, just basically get a lot of information on that particular item. Um, one of the things that I like to use as well, that some of our teams have used is under the Discover tool. Um, this is just one example, but uh, one of our teams had an issue where on our mobile app, a spinner was loading and if someone canceled a login, the spinner would not go away. It would just stay there on the screen. So it's an issue that we're tracking um, just by being able to use Discover, we can drill in on this specific issue that we're having. And um, if we need to zone in on something specific, we can go and find out information on timing and uh, inf other information about you know, details of the phone and uh, any kind of stack trace that we need to see for that. Um, I mentioned that every couple of weeks we do a review with the department. Uh, another uh, Discover chart that we use that's really helpful is our top exceptions. Um, what this lists is basically like over the past 14 days, you know, what are the busiest uh, things that are really impacting our, uh, our, our, our application? In this case, it's showing a bit of stuff that's related mostly to like service outages, um, but in some cases it may not be. Uh, for instance, I can see here that this wide blue mark here that was this error here in our QA environment seems to be ended. So I, I think that think that that one's going to fall off the chart here. But uh, these things are get, they get reported on, on a departmental basis, and teams are usually encouraged to not stay on that list. So uh, they they like to to uh, find out these things and then uh, deal with them right away so that they're they're not on the list the next time. Um, but here we got some issues again on this chart. We can drill down into other details about you know specific issues concerning a smaller time frame. But uh, all of this is really really awesome information to have. Um, another thing I like to show is basically our billing summary. Um, what this is showing us here is that we just started a new billing period, but it's showing us that right now in the first couple of days we've had, um, we're on track to basically go past our quota and. Um, and, and spend more money than maybe we should be spending. So uh, this is really great tool because it allows us to see before we start getting billed, you know, more money than, than we're expecting. Uh, it gives us plenty of time to change the curve on that and to uh, bring it to a lower level. So that's all, uh, uh, you know, really great information to have. Um, one thing that I've started using too is alerts. Um, for instance, I get an, I have it set up so that if we get uh, basically a hundred exceptions within a five minute period for a repo that uh, sends me an email that kind of gives me a better visibility on some urgent issue that's happening right then. Um, usually we're below that, but obviously we had an issue earlier in the month where uh, you know we probably had a service outage that, yeah, the service outage that uh, uh, basically just spiked a little bit and, and we dealt with it and overcame it. Um, and, I think that's basically the, uh, the overview there. So um, just to kind of recap the results of that, um, it's definitely a lot less configuration overhead for the team. Uh, basically our code owners file is checked into our repo so teams can manage themselves as far as you know, how Sentry assigns issues. Um, 15 to 20 minutes you know, triage time with code owners, that, that, that's a guess, but but it's an easy guess because of all the you know, circling back and forth between users that we used to have. Um, and Sentry definitely helps us troubleshoot issues and identify patterns a lot more fast than we, than we ever were. Um, it's really great to be able to identify all the affected users that we have and be able to reach out to them uh, or, or at least notify them if there's an issue that, that they are encountering. Um, yeah, and just in general, just, just having better ownership and of different exceptions. If some things can get uh, misassigned, but it's easy to just assign them to the correct team. And um, I think one of the biggest insights I had just coming up with this presentation is that our, our QA staff, the ninjas, um, it, they gain a lot of insight into the stuff that's coming on. Not only can they get a lot of information just by, you know, seeing, being able to associate end users with the issues, but you know, they, they can see, you know, what the impact and severity is of that by seeing how many users are affected and how many of these exceptions are we, are we getting, uh, you know, what time of day. Um, and uh, something else just working with Sentry is, is that if you use their product, um, ask them if, you're, if there's something missing that you want, um, you know, definitely ask them. They're, they're interested in improving their product too. 
Um, code owners is one of those things. Uh, it, before it existed, uh, I reached out and, and asked if, hey, this would be helpful for us. And they're like, well, coincidentally, we're about to release it. Uh, so that was really awesome timing on their part. And it has become just a, a great tool, uh, a great feature for us to just make Sentry that much of a better product. Um, so what's next for us? Um, discover queries, I think we're underutilizing it. So I think we can do a lot better at that. Um, just helping us prioritize issues and focus on specific issues that we're working on. Um, we haven't done much with releases, but uh, I definitely think the releases tab can help us link our you know, issues to specific releases to make rollback decisions a lot faster. And um, I've seen a few of these workshops now and they're just, usually there's definitely tons of information that I get out of it that um, is just so helpful and, and, and helps me use Sentry better and helps it be a better tool for me. And hopefully I've, I've helped people you know, make some realizations today and, and I'll definitely be attending future workshops. And uh, to close this out, Power is hiring. Uh, developers, Ruby on Rails, React Mobile, um, UX and site reliability engineers, um, that's in our Philadelphia headquarters. And we also have remote opportunities for those positions. Um, and in the Philadelphia area, we're also hiring tech support. So you can be a cool ninja too. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, just check out techatpower.com and um, learn more and apply. So thank you for your time. And I guess I'll pass it over to Jasmine. Thank you, Wade, for that powerful presentation. It's great to see your team has built Discover charts to monitor and investigate critical issues to improve how you handle outages moving forward. As Dorothy mentioned, I'm Jasmine, your PM for Discover and Dashboards, and I'll be walking you through our vision and sharing some updates on what we've been working on. What if you wanted to go beyond the out-of-the-box century experience? We have curated views into performance, issues, releases, projects, but what if you have specific questions you want to answer with your Sentry data, like which of my customers are experiencing slow API calls or which browser encounters the most issues for my site? Discover gives you a backstage pass to the underlying event data so you can explore it with free form query building, giving you the answers you're looking for. Slice and dice your data by any parameter you care about, such as by project, a specific API call, web page, device, location, you name it. So if Discover is your backstage pass, then Dashboards is your custom playlist of flexible visualizations, providing insight into your team's work and effectiveness, as well as your app health and stability. Identify the areas that need immediate attention and keep your team aligned on their KPIs and get that much more value from your Sentry data. Now I'd like to get into some of the features we've released and what we've been working on. We've listened to your feedback and it was a no brainer for us to build a more cohesive experience between dashboards and Discover as they are interconnected. And we did this in two ways. One, we made it very easy to add any save Discover query to dashboards. So you can avoid the situation where you're rebuilding the same query twice. Conversely, we gave our users the ability to drill down into Discover from any dashboard widget for further investigation. These features combined help you answer the questions you care about and help you answer questions you have about your services even faster and the questions that you care about. Moving on, we've also introduced chart unfurls in Slack. And this is really building on top of our robust Slack integration we have at Century. So now when you share the URL for a Discover Graph in Slack, the visualization will show up as the link unfurls. This is a way to add valuable context and continuity to your communications it's also a great convenience feature for our customers. It allows users to share Discover graphs with folks in their Slack workspace who may not have an account on Sentry. I don't know why you wouldn't have an account on Sentry, but if you don't, this is for you. And as well as share these charts on mobile if you use the Slack mobile app. The next feature I'd like to talk about is enhanced top results display. So listening to our feedback from customers, we've improved this exact capability. So now you can visualize up to 10 results of a query, and that could be your top five front-end transactions, your top eight projects, or your top three issues. 
If you recall, Wade demonstrated that he uses this feature when his team routinely reviews their top five exceptions in Discover. We've also introduced the other series in the top results charts, so you can easily compare the remaining events to your top results. Uh, so you can also uncover any anomalies or spikes that were previously hidden. So we recognize it used to be hard to understand the health of your projects and whether you're using Sentry effectively. With the team stats page, you can now see if your team is responding effectively to problems and how your app health is trending over time. For example, you can have a cross project view for crash free sessions over a comparison time, time period. You see in this example, we have the last eight weeks versus the last seven days. You also have insight into how many new issues are being triaged with the reviewed issues rate. So you see in this example, Project Empower Plant has a 98.9% .9 reviewed percentage. This team velocity page is for all you managers out in the audience. This is particularly useful for you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come to our webinar. So now I'd like to get into some of the upcoming features that we are currently working on. So issue, state, issue states and ownerships and dashboards. Right now, there's a gap in terms of issue properties you can filter in the issue stream and what we offer in dashboards today. So we are working on closing that gap with issue state filters, such as unresolved, ignored, foreseen, and dashboards and issue ownership filters so as to understand what issues are being assigned to what teams or individuals. So for example, Wade mentioned he uses code owners and this would be a great use case for him to put together a leaderboard of his team's top issues and who is responsible for taking action on them. Overall, bringing in this new wave of data to dashboards can provide deeper actionable insight into app health and team effectiveness, as well as a more seamless experience across the Sentry application. Now, dashboard widget library. So here, we wanted to lower the time you would need to invest when you build a dashboard from scratch and really simplify that process. So we are currently developing this feature where a user can pick from a fully formed widget off a menu. The value here is really twofold. One, users can build dashboards with significantly less effort. Two, now that you have a whole library of widget examples, you can edit those widgets and see how they work and see what queries are behind them. We can give our users a helping hand in learning our query syntax this way and these they can use these pre-built as a jumping off point to start building their own widgets. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to get into dashboard layout improvements. So this feature is really about improving the usefulness of dashboards by introducing a grid-based layout and making it easier to understand the data represented in your dashboard. We will soon support widget resizing so you can make sure that nothing is cut off and be able to display information in a way that suits your preferences as well as we'll be implementing a dynamic number of columns. So the three column view is no longer fixed. Ultimately, you can optimize how you see your data at a glance. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. Now I'd like to pass it off to, to, to Adam to demo you some of these features in real time. Perfect. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. One second. Hey everyone. So um, as thanks for the handoff, Jasmine. So uh, my name is Adam. I'm a senior solutions engineer here for Sentry. Um, and particularly today during the demo, I'm gonna be taking on the role as, of an engineering manager. Um, as an engineering manager, right, I may not be interested in troubleshooting specific parts of my application, you know, finding the exact line of code to troubleshoot a uh, application issue, but I will, I, or I am interested in using Sentry's Discover and uh, dashboard capabilities in order to understand and gain a comprehensive understanding of my entire organization. And so in today's example, let's say a developer on my team sent me this interesting Discover query, right? There's a couple of interesting spikes here. They mentioned that I may, I may want to spend some time and investigate this a little bit further. So I'll go ahead and open this up. And once I open it up, you'll go ahead and be able to see that I've essentially already filtered this down to three, two different fields and one function that was applied. So essentially uh, the issue field and title field. Issue, if for those uh, folks who are kind of new to Sentry, 
an issue is essentially an aggregation of similar errors. And we primarily do this aggregation uh, based off stack trace. Um, so similarity in the stack trace. Um, and, and this helps reduce noise, right? So instead of getting alerted for multiple different errors, where you're going to be alerted on one particular issue, right? Uh, title is another field. This is just a simple string of text to essentially represent what the title of this particular uh, issue is. And then count, number of times this has occurred, right? Uh, you can also, in the column section, add in multiple different functions if you wanted to, uh, fields, and tags, but for now, we'll kind of keep things simple and we won't mess around too much on the column section. We also have uh, the ability to uh, add in different equations here too. So this is helpful and I'll show a little bit um, about this uh, a little bit later on, but essentially this is helpful if you want to look at things like ratios, unhandled errors versus errors in general or handled errors to unhandled errors. Um, so equations are there too, but again, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep it just to these three. So let me go ahead and just remove these. And so one last thing to talk about, I think that's helpful is, uh, I saw earlier in the Q and A, people were asking about tags too. So you get a good amount of default tagging that comes right out of the box. And then there's some that are custom, like customer type, right? And so as a engineering manager, let's say, to be even more specific, I'm an engineering manager at an e-commerce company, right? Um, I would have, let's say, different type of customers that I may want to segment and focus this view on. And I would be able to do that pretty easily simply by clicking on a, a relevant section within the heat map. And then I would be able to zoom in on just that particular part. Um, but for now, that's not super relevant. I mean, the main thing I want to look at is what's causing those spikes, right? That's what the engineer on my team had wanted to highlight to me. So there was this spike, and I think this spike were some of the ones that they mentioned that I should take a closer look at. So I'm actually going to go ahead and zoom in on this relevant part of the discovered query. And then I'm going to use uh, essentially what was talked about earlier, right? Kind of bubble up my top 10 uh, errors for this period. So I'm actually going to go top period and then go to top 10. And then you'll see as I essentially zoom in or hover over these, kind of what are those errors, right? So it looks like not enough inventory for products. So remember, I'm an e-commerce company. So this is definitely not good if customers are trying to buy something and they're experiencing this error of not being able to find enough inventory. It looks like that's also somehow being correlated to some front-end error that's, that's occurring. That makes sense. And then also it looks like I'm experiencing a bunch of UI errors here, some kind of missed button handling on the JavaScript side. So again, this is not good, but at least now as a manager, I understand what's driving those spikes, right? And then this is where going back to one of the fields, the issue field, this is really cool. I have the ability to directly go into that existing issue in Sentry. So instead of having to go around in the UI and try figuring out what's the stack trace, what's the line of code that might be causing this problem within one click, it's basically linked. I can go directly into the issue. I get all the relevant context that I need. And again, because I'm a manager, I probably won't be spending time to, to troubleshoot this, but what I, could, what I can do is simply take this link, go back into my Slack, post it in there, and have the relevant uh, team members uh, troubleshoot it. The other thing I could do, so if I go back uh, page, the other thing I could do is I could go ahead and set up an alert directly off this query as well. So if I wanted to kind of detect these spikes in the future, either myself or a relevant colleague or a developer on my team could go ahead and create that alert. I won't spend too much time on alerting. I think that's its own. There's all kinds of new stuff that we released within alerting that, that I think that's its own uh, separate workshop. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and add this to, uh, to my dashboard, right? So I'm Again, I'm an engineering manager. I have a weekly, let's say, uh, health check dashboard where I'm gauging how my organization is using Sentry and also we're kind of getting a read on what's going on. Where should I be focusing my engineering and my developers efforts? And so I'm gonna go ahead, add this to a dashboard. I have the ability to go ahead and create a new, you know, add it to a completely new dashboard. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and add it to my weekly dashboard here called weekly review. Um, you can call, call it whatever. I'm just going to keep the default name, weekly errors and performance data. In the visualization display, this is where I'm going to change it to table. Um, and you'll see we have a good number of different visualizations here. You'll see some of the other visualizations um, a little bit later on. But for now, I'm going to just show you table. 
This is where if you wanted to specify this a little bit more, for example, if you wanted to say something like uh, a particular browser name or browser type, you could go ahead and specify that here. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I just wanted to mention that that, that is an option. And, and then what you have the ability to do is you can see I have, the, uh, I have my uh, table down here, my issue, my title, account. And then on top of that, what you have the ability uh, to do is you could uh, sort it by different counts, right? So in this case, I want to go ahead and just sort by descending count. So essentially bubble up my most problematic issues at the very top. And then I could go ahead and add this. So um, I've already added this already. So I'm actually going to go ahead and just go to straight to the dashboard um, just to kind of prevent duplicates. So if I go into the dashboard weekly review, you'll see that I have a couple of visualizations here. Most importantly, the top issues. So this is the tile that we were looking at earlier. I just relabeled it and provided a couple of additional tweaks to it, but for the most part, this is exactly what we were looking at earlier. I just added it to kind of complete my comprehensive view of my organization. And so the first thing I wanted to call out here that's really cool is, is for the folks who are kind of uh, more familiar with Century, you may have noticed, you may have noticed that we have the, you may have, you may have noticed that we have an ability at, uh, to get a more comprehensive view of what's going on within your organization. So instead of it being focused on a particular project, you have the ability now to basically have this data from multiple projects. So there are, for example, issue alerts that focus maybe on one particular project. In this case, you have all projects available to you. You could get a comprehensive view across your entire organization. If you wanted to, you could slice and dice this information on a particular project or environment name. Uh, for now, I'm pretty happy with this kind of overall view. And I think it's helpful to go over some of these visualiz visualizations and more importantly, why are they important to me as a manager? So events per minute. So this is essentially a simple big number. A big number is, is a metric, single metric around an important piece of information. In this case, I want to look at how many events, whether that be performance events or uh, issues, uh, how many events are being sent from my SDKs at any given time. So this is not necessarily indicative of a problem if this rises. If anything, this might mean that I'm just gathering more performance data, which you know might be a great thing. But then as I further unpack this, this number, there's more, it adds more context to this number, right? So in this case, I have my error events that are coming in, so 835. Um, of course, I want to keep this number as low as possible. Unique users. So this is great if I just released a new feature, I want to ideally see this number go up. But um, also what could be problematic is if the number is going up and my error count is going up, probably not the best. So that's why I kind of want to make sure that, that I keep track of these numbers. Um, these line charts, I'm going to go into these a little bit later on as to why they're super useful. But the main thing here is, is it got it, the, or the main thing here is the things that I'm tracking. So with the line chart, this is latency or traffic, right? So what is my uh, slowest running transactions or services? And then within errors, uh, basically I want to make sure that if, you know, a spike in a unhandled errors occurs, then I'm going to be able to catch that. So far it looks like there's more handled than unhandled. So that looks good. And then I have these table charts that further unpack these views, right? So I have essentially what are my slowest running transactions that might be driving any spikes here, as well as what are my top issues that might be driving spikes here as well. Now, there's two other uh, tiles you may have noticed that I've kind of used that essentially kind of interweaves these tiles. So one is releases, right? Like I want, might want to track some of this information across releases. So I have that listed here. And in particular, what I've set up is, is I want to be able to identify uh, if there's any new alert or any uh, huge surge in uh, errors on any particular release. I also want to be able to track if there's any new surge in issues. And again, remember issues is grouping for uh, errors. And so if what could happen is, is, you know, you get one new issue introduced in a particular uh, release, then, and then you get, let's say 10,000 errors. Well, that might be uh, problematic, right? That might be something that's worth investigating if there's only one issue that's causing over 10,000 errors, right? And so we got error count, we have issue count, and this is all tracked across releases. Um, the only other thing I'll mention about this view is we do support the ability to also set up alerts around this information. So you could be able to you know, set up certain alerts that are coming in on particular releases. And then last tile to kind of wrap up this dashboard is a world map. Kind of just allowing me again i'm an e-commerce company i want to be able to focus on where i'm experiencing my errors right so great i have this dashboard 
I have a good amount of different visualizations that I'm showing here. I think the thing that um, that I would want to do now is is let's say we go into a week. Let's let's uh, let's pretend I'm going out into a week. I have my dashboard now. I'm checking this periodically to help gauge uh, and lead my team, like gauge them where where we could spend the most amount of uh, calories and efforts. I'm looking and I see, hey, there's a particular spike here that looks interesting. Maybe that's worth further investigation. And so this is what I was talking about where the line charts are super helpful is because now I could go ahead, zoom in on a relevant part that looks interesting to me. You can see how the dashboard kind of molds and adjusts around that particular point of interest. And then from here, I can now go the other way around, right? So whereas earlier I went from a Slack message to discover to dashboards, I can now go the other way. So what I mean by that is I see the spike. I see that, hey, it looks like something with my products, products catalog is taking forever for my customers to be able to access. I'm going to go ahead and open this up in Discover. Once I open this up in Discover, I could go ahead and then open up the relevant group of that transactions, right? So this all, these all look fairly similar. That's all, they're kind of different um, uh, users trying to interact with the product catalog and it's just taking forever for the products to load up. So I'm actually going to go ahead, open up that particular event. And now that I have a little bit more information, I'm going to go ahead and just slack this to the relevant team member that, it, that would be able to best troubleshoot this. So I could go ahead and pop it into Slack. And then the other thing I could do is if I go back here, I could go ahead, take this full query and also paste it for the rest of my team for them to be able to look at it. So essentially what I just did to kind of recap is I got, I started off by my developing developer team basically sending me an interesting discover query for me to investigate further. From there, I then plop that onto my dashboard, my weekly dashboard that I use to gauge the uh, my, my developers productivity and to gauge overall where there might be problems within my organization. Then from there, what I ended up doing is, is I ended up using that and finding something interesting that I could then uh, use discover to further query. And then I was able to take that, plop that into Slack, and have the rest of my team be able to then do some further investigation, potentially look into some of those issues. So the last thing I'll just mention before um, uh, ending is that you may have noticed if I go back to the dashboards uh, is that we have a lot of these pre-built dashboards. These are things that uh, we at Century, me and my team, we uh, take an active effort to basically enable our customers with building out what we consider uh, or what we call app packs. So uh, feel free to reach out at sales at century.io or your friendly customer or your friendly CSM to essentially uh, get an app pack set up for you. We're always happy to, to work with you and help set up uh, the best dashboards that could provide the best insights to your team. So that's everything on my side, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Adam, Jasmine, Wade. Um, that was really, really awesome to kind of see some of the use cases and examples for Discover and dashboards. Um, now we are going to go to Q&A and thank you everyone for asking really, really great questions. Keep them coming. Um, we have some time. So um, this first question, I believe, is actually for Wade. Um, it was a question that came in on how did you integrate Sentry? Did you simply uh, impl implement it and let it catch everything? Are you using scope? Are you triggering events manually? Um, and if so, in which circumstances? Yeah, for that, I mean, we basically use the libraries that Sentry provides for different languages. Um, in our case, we have some for um, mobile clients, uh, iOS and uh, Android apps. Uh, JavaScript and Ruby on Rails, and um, it's easy to kind of uh, just by default plugging it in, it will start taking exceptions and recording them, uh, but you can definitely trigger them on your own. We do that quite a bit, uh, especially when we're focusing on specific issues or want some awareness over stuff that's not necessarily breaking the code, but we want to trigger it to track it. Um, and there was uh, some comments in there about, you know, tracking user information. And uh, if you're sensitive about user information, it's up to you whether you track it at all. Um, but if you do track it, it, it's up to you and your your team to kind of decide what information you want to relay to Sentry for that. Um, if it's just an ID or something, then then that's all you have to send. Um, but but it's pretty easy. You just plug it in, and it will do the the basic you know capturing that it can with the stack trace and everything. But um, 
uh, obviously you need to put your teams into Sentry and then find a way to so associate those. And, um, you know, code owners is a good way to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. This next question, I think, is for the Sentry team. So either Jasmine um, or Adam. What determines a handled versus an unhandled error? Is it only if the capture exception method was used or not? Yeah, so I, I guess I can answer that. So, and we also have docs on this too, but essentially the SDK captures all unhandled errors automatically. Uh, handled errors are typically where you do the century doc capture error, I think is with the, within the SDK. Those are the ones that would be considered handled errors. Um, but otherwise, by default, unhandled exceptions are caught by Sentry's SDK. Awesome. Um, great. And then this next question, I think, is maybe potentially also for you, Adam. Um, which issues from the unresolved issues will go to the for review tab? Uh, yeah. Let me let me think on that for a sec. I'll bubble back to it. But yeah, I saw that question too, and I, I didn't have a time. <laughs> no worries. We can uh, we can come back to it. Um, while you do that, um, I think this might be for I'll, I'll jump back to Wade. Actually, there's another question, um, I believe, for you on. Can you talk a little bit about how you manage transactions versus errors in your workflow? Um, we don't I wouldn't say we really make a distinction between the two. I mean, it, as far as the transactions go, usually the transaction is part of the event. So, it, you know, if we're seeing the event, we're seeing, you know, related transaction details as well um, in, in the stack trace. Awesome. Um, all right, let's see. Next, next question, um, back to the Sentry team. Is there any standard pack of rules for alerting issues that are signals of an app is down? And what custom rules do you use for detecting app outages? I'm happy to ta tackle this as well, uh, unless Jasmine <laughs> wants to fill in, uh, let me know. Um, okay, so kind of like what standard rules are there and then what is custom, yeah. so. Some of the standard rules, the default rules are things like a new issue shows up within your project, right? That, that's a kind of a standard rule that you'll get um, with any new project you set up. Um, and then on top of that, we have basically like alert rule templates where you would base, you would just need to provide a couple of inputs on your end to, to customize them. But most of the work is already done for you. And that's another thing where I would like to make a plug on the app packs that I mentioned earlier is I'm always, you know, the... SE team is always willing to help out. So let us know kind of what you want. Um, and as long as we have some direction, we're happy to build. I, I'll build countless errors and alerts for, um, for or sorry, countless alerts for my customers. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question is, is that anything custom, we can help you, but you do get a fair number of templates and alerts out of the box. Awesome. Um, Adam, potentially another question for you. I think this happened during your demo, but um, in your in your context, how do you use or manage your traces underscore sample underscore rate setting? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would have to maybe drill into a little bit more and like what what manages. I think I understand the question, but. Um, but I, I think what, what they're asking is is, is kind of like, yeah, how do I figure out what is the proper sample rate um, to ingest the right amount of information? And I think there's there's two ways to answer that. The first way is, is that um, we have the ability to uh, sample different kinds of transaction types. So you, you're, you could essentially set up your own rules around the various transaction types that you would want to ingest it into Sentry. So you could get pretty specific. Um, and so in that case, right. we're seeing the, the web app, there were the like the front end checkout transactions that I wanted to maybe sample a little bit more of versus some of the other transaction types. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is, is uh, typically for customers who, who are curious about that, what we recommend is when they're trying this out in like a proof of concept, they go ahead and just send out maybe all you know, basically the full volume. So that way we kind of gauge it. But I think typically, if I remember correctly, it's like a two to one ratio between the errors 
that are being sent in and the transactions that are being sent in. So that's the kind of ratio. I think it's two to one or three to one. Um, so those are just kind of best tips and tricks. But again, it's it's also something like, you know, during a POC, we, we like to figure out what the customers do. Awesome. Um, let's see, question for you, Wade. Um, any recommendations on onboarding a new QA team into Sentry? Um, they are new to the product. And I think just maybe just to reiterate, to kind of speak to the audience on that, I think you might've typed an answer, but just want to reiterate. Yeah, um, I think, I don't know our specific QA process for, for onboarding, but I do know that they give an introduction to Sentry. That, so they'll walk through their, their process and, and an overview of what, uh, what they typically look for. And, all of our uh, ninjas typically, you know, they'll have a period of time where they're shadowing other ninjas as they're learning and then transition over to actually taking calls themselves. And they get a great exposure to, you know, how useful it is and how to use it through that process. It's not like they do a, a, a ton of different things with it. And, and we've definitely got tons of people on the team with the expertise to, to answer questions. So I think just in short, just, you know, they get a general overview of how do you log into it and what's an exception to um, to like, okay, here's how we use it on a call. And that's usually, uh, yeah, seems to be what our process is. But I can find out more details and post that somewhere. Also, I have an answer, if it's okay, Dorothy, to the earlier yeah. question regarding the poor review. Yeah, so, so to answer that question, so again, just to repeat what the question was for everyone on the call is essentially how do you take unresolved or unhandled errors and how does that get moved to the four resolves tab or resolve tab within the century issues view? So essentially think of it as, as almost kind of like your uh, Google inbox, Gmail inbox, is that when you see something come in from unresolved, so by default, they're going to go to the unresolved queue. And then you essentially go through those and you there's a little toggle option within the UI, where as you go through it, you just check off the things that you want you could go ahead and resolve it. So think of that as almost kind of like, you know, getting back to an email or something. You're just moving it to a different queue. Um, so so it's pretty easy. And Adam, you guys use that for some metrics and stuff within Sentry too, right? I mean, like time to resolution. Yeah, exactly. Time to resolution. Also, another thing that you can do is, is you can do things like resolved upon the next release. So you could time it where a new release comes in and you resolve something. So there's a couple of different things you could do there. Um, but yeah, as we had mentioned, uh, that is quite important when we're measuring things like, yeah, time to resolution. Awesome. Um, we had one question for you from Juan. Um, how do you manage the interaction between issue tracker and Sentry in terms of assigning issues, managing different dashboard windows, et cetera? Um, it, I guess you really have your own distinct that view in Sentry when you log in. So um, as far as managing it, it's we, we kind of leave teams to manage themselves in, in a lot of cases. Some things that are, are above a team uh, that may not filter down that low. Um, people like me from a more you know higher level will make sure that things are associated with the team. Um, but you know it, it's a it pretty much each team has their own thing that they, they do in the system and use it how best the, their team uses it. I don't know if that answers the questions fully, but uh, but it's the best answer I have. Awesome. Uh, no, it, it works. I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, it does help. It seems like so. Great answer, Wade. <laughs> um, all right. I think uh, we got that question down. Um, all right, I believe this question is to the Sentry team. Um, someone has, they've integrated Sentry to ClickUp, um, but is there any way to go down to the project level with that opposed to everything going up into one ClickUp list? I'll just mention, I, I would have to look into that. I'm not, personally, I'm not too familiar with Click, ClickUp unless someone else uh, has an answer, but yeah, I would have to look into that further. No worries. We can we can follow up um, separately as well with some documentation and whatnot. So, um, all right. Trying to figure out. There's more questions. Um, all right. How do you get into app packs? Uh, there's only they only see a default dashboard. Does it require any specific subscription plan? Oh, that's a uh, my favorite question. <laughs> I don't know who asked that, but. Uh... 
But yeah, so it's one of those things. So by default, you have a couple of dashboards, but then this is where if you reach out, if you're an existing Sentry customer, reach out to, um, I believe you're assigned CSM or you're assigned uh, sales uh, account representative, um, and we would be happy. That's where I normally will then partner up with them and help build out the relevant um, app pack. Uh, so that typically consists of just getting on a call and kind of figuring out what's important to you. And then we would be able to go ahead and start building out something that would be relevant. So it typically would consist of some of the standard tiles that you're seeing and then some that are unique to you. So yeah, I think that's, that's the answer and I'm happy to, to help further answer any questions about that too. Awesome. Um, let's see one question. I don't know if we can answer this, but we'll try. Um, do we have plans to add regular expressions for queries in dashboards? That's a good question. I th yeah, I think that Jasmine, do you want to take that? I think that's a product direction question. Okay. Um, I would probably need a bit more elaboration on that question because we have added arithmetic, which I think Adam may have briefly showed in his demo, but I would need, I would likely follow up with that question just, just to get a bit more insight into what exactly the types of expressions you're looking for. Right. I think in general, it's, it's more about wildcard searching. For sure. Um, awesome. I think those, it sounds like we've answered at least most of the questions that have not, we will definitely be following up with you guys after. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining. We are pretty much um, at time. Um, there is a question, just a reminder or a survey, a two question survey at the end of this, once this webinar ends. Um, if you don't mind just filling that out, that is super, super helpful to us to just improve these and make sure they are uh, relevant and valuable for you guys. So um, without further ado, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and week. Thanks, everyone.